asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Let's welcome our first guest to the programme. I can't believe that it's been, um, it's been nearly three years since she was on the show. And when she was on the show, it was a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed listening to her. And I'm glad that she's uh, agreed to come back on the show. Now, she's uh, an academic. I told you earlier on, she's got a PhD. Uh, she's a biochemist PhD, but she's been a political activist and a political candidate, even a presidential candidate. She's a libertarian. She's an author and a successful one, and she's got a brand new book out, which we're going to talk about now. Now, you might know or you might not know, but back in 1962, amendments to the Food and Drug Act in the US shaved, well, at least she argues, shaved at least five years off of the lifespan of Americans without actually making drugs safer and more effective. She argues that this shifted the medical paradigm from inexpensive prevention to costly treatment. It censored life-saving nutritional approaches to disease and it added lots of time. In fact, it added 10 years to the time it takes to get a new drug from the lab into the marketplace. She believes it also destroyed small companies, small drug producing companies as well, and it basically killed competition. Uh, the book is entitled Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It. Let's welcome to the programme, or welcome back to the programme even, uh, Dr. Mary Ruart. Mary, welcome back. How are you? Well, thank you, Richie. I'm fine and I'm really glad to be here. I tell you what, it's a long time. I think we, when we finished up about three years, I, I enjoyed speaking with you. I'm not a libertarian. I don't pretend to be. I don't know what I am, Mary. Um, I, I, I don't, I suppose I don't describe myself as anything, but I really enjoyed um, engaging with you on these issues. This is, this is brilliant because for a lot of people, they will instantly think, well, this is kind of upside down. We, we need to regulate these companies. We need to, we need to watch them. And if we don't, it is more easy for them to do to do great harm. You know, people might mention some of the times over the years when big pharma companies have lost major lawsuits because they actually put out harmful drugs. So for people, for some people, Mary, and you know this, you debate this all the time, they will say, well, come on, we need regulations. We need to watch these companies, right? Go ahead, Mary. Sure. Well, actually, the marketplace and certification is a better regulator than a government agency. And that's because a government agency is consumed by politics. They just can't help it since they get their money from, you know, the other, uh, the, uh, con in, in the U.S. from the congressional offices. And of course, uh, there's a similar political bent in Europe. And I have to say, you know, these regulations, even though they were meant to start in the U.S. have kind of rippled outward into the world and really affect everyone because most of the drug discoveries are still made in the U.S. So if we kill innovation, which is something that these amendments have done, they've destroyed about 50 to 80 percent of our innovation, then obviously that's felt throughout the world because innovation is really what saves lives. No matter how much money you have, you can't buy something that hasn't been developed yet. You know, for example, Rothschild, who of course was, was very wealthy, the, um, the one who established the banking industry, he, he really died of an infection that could have been, could have been cured with antibiotics, but they weren't out yet. They weren't developed. They weren't invented or innovated. So he, he died of something that we probably wouldn't have to worry about today. So innovation is extremely important. And as I said, it affects everyone throughout the world. Now, on that, I, I, I absolutely get the argument that regulation has failed in the past. It, it definitely has. I mean, when you look at drugs like Vioxx and other drugs yes. that I could mention. So obviously regulation didn't prevent Merck getting to the market with bad drugs. But where, where I have a big problem, and I've interviewed co colleagues of yours, Mary, and people that you would have come across over the years, people like Jeff Berwick and others, and we've, we've butted heads on this. Um, you're going to go away today, Mary, thinking this guy's a bit of a socialist. I wouldn't describe myself as a socialist, but w w the way I look at it is nobody's ever been able to effectively persuade me, and I'm very open-minded, how the marketplace 
would self-regulate. If companies are desperate to get drugs out there in order to get them on the market to make money, how could we trust... And I know you're going to explain this in a way that I can understand it, or at least I hope you are anyway. How, how I'm come, going to try. <laughs> we're going to try, yeah. How can, we, uh, how, come, how can we, or how could we possibly depend on the market to regulate itself? Well, one of the things we have to realize is that when a company puts a bad drug on the market, it suffers. For example, when Biox came out and was withdrawn from the market, there were a lot of lawsuits against the company that resulted in them paying out much more than they ever made on Biox. So this is, this is one of the ways in which the marketplace punishes companies that put out bad drugs. But it's not simply that. Um, certainly, there are ways to evaluate drugs. And, and I should mention, because many of your listeners might not know this, the regulatory agencies, and of course, I'm including the FDA in this, they generally don't do any studies at all. What they do is they direct the pharmaceutical companies to do certain studies. And then when those reports are available, the FDA evaluates the reports. So we actually have the drug companies testing their own drugs, which, you know, works out in a way because it actually, even though you could fake the results, it goes through so many different people, it's kind of hard to do. But it would be much better probably to have third party testing. And this is what a certifier would do. In fact, this, this used to happen in the United States. The American Medical Association used to do their own tests on new drugs, and then they'd report out in their journal whether they gave it their seal of approval or not. And then people who wanted to take the drug, of course, could do that. But people who, you know, were hesitant and waited until the seal of approval was available, of course, were more cautious. And so this really helped people back in 1938 when one company put out a, a pretty safe drug, but they put it in a solvent that, or a solution that wasn't safe and people died. And the American Medical Association had not given their seal of approval to this drug. So cautious doctors, you know, never had given it to patients. So this is the way certification works. If you're desperate, you can try something that isn't fully tested. But if you're not, of course, you want to wait. What I propose in my book is that we take the um, requirement for having FDA approval out of the equation and change the FDA into a certifying agency. That way, people who liked to have the 14 years of testing instead of the four years of testing could wait until the FDA approved the drug or blessed the drug because it wouldn't be approving it anymore, but gave it its seal of approval. Whereas people who wanted to take it earlier because maybe they were terminal or their, their disease was so horrific that it was worth the risk, they could go directly to the pharmaceutical companies and buy it or the companies could market it earlier than the FDA uh, certification. So you can see that there's different ways to do this. Now, you know, one of the things we, we use, of course, in the U.S. is certification for electrical appliances. UL puts their seal of approval on electrical appliances, and we can buy electrical appliances without that seal, but most people prefer to wait until UL has given its certified seal of approval. And in that way, drugs could be certified as well. And the nice thing about having a certification um, agency like UL is UL works with the companies to make the product safe. With the FDA, it's more of an adversarial type relationship between right. the drug company and the agency, and that creates some problems. So it's like a different type of regulator, then, Mary, because it's yes. like another. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a different type of regulator because obviously, you know, the the we're, we're talking about the FDA, uh, by the way. And for any of our listeners who don't understand, that's the Food and Drug Administration. It's the U.S.'s regulatory body for uh, for food and for pharmaceuticals and, and for medicines. One of the things I've observed over the years is a, redu a revolving door policy. And, yes. and lobbying um, has led to, you know, complete ineffectiveness by this group, this FDA. You're basically advocating a more transparent, a more open and a more separate organisation to to effectively regulate. Because one of the things that I've, you know, being a, being a current affairs producer and presenter for many years, I've learned that some of the practices of these companies are heinous, you know, testing in third world countries, Mary, on people because, you know, they can give people a couple of bucks 
maybe 50 bucks a day to be tested on, not testing in the country where the drugs are ultimately going to be sold. These horrible practices. And then you look at these massive companies whose bottom line is the bottom line and they have shareholders to answer to. And they've got a, everything has to be factored towards increasing dividend for shareholders. And I'm not going to go into a big socialist versus libertarian thing here. But ultimately, I see that's what's wrong with these with, with these massive companies. And I'd be terrified of the market. That's, right, go ahead, go ahead, jump in, jump in, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, Richie, that all that that you're talking about is very problematic. And it actually stems directly from the amendments. Before the amendments, there wasn't much of a revolving door. But what happened when the amendments came into play they were so difficult to understand and the FDA was, you know, would change its mind. And so what companies started doing is hiring people away from the FDA that knew the culture, knew all the ins and outs and could help them navigate this labyrinth <laughs> of yeah. regulations, which was quite unclear for a number of years and, and actually still is to some extent. So that's what started that revolving door. And that's part of the problem is that these amendments distorted the pharmaceutical industry. It really reshaped them and made it possible for the greedy to triumph. And, and one way in which it does this is that, especially in our generic drugs here in the United States, and this may be happening in Europe too, when, when the FDA starts coming down on the generic manufacturers, as it did about 10 years ago, and really made you know, the manufacturing process so much more difficult, a lot of the companies dropped out of the generic business. And what ended up happening was some of the older generics now only had one company that would make them. Wow. So and prices so, went up. Prices went happened. up. Yeah, that, that you could see where that could lead to greed yeah. because one company makes it. It's a monopoly, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's so hugely that's important because I was going to ask you that because, again, sure. by the way, folks, um, I'm speaking with um, Mary Ruart. Now, Mary um, was on this program a couple of years ago, which was a really interesting conversation at the time. Uh, her new book, Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It. Um, fascinating book, fascinating read. Mary was kind enough to uh, share the book with me in advance. I don't always get an advanced copy of the book, but I like what I've been reading. It's, it's, it's difficult for people to get out of the mindset, you know, if you're fixed into a mindset. Like, I'm very much anti, you know, I'm very much anti-deregulation by default, I suppose. And I'm very much, you know, anti the practices of major corporations. But if you just give a little bit of time and thought to to, to the libertarian perspective, you can see, I can see where Mary uh, is coming from. Death by regulation, how we were robbed of a golden age of health and how we can reclaim it. And ultimately, Mary, and Mary, of course, PhD in biophysics, libertarian activist, these, you demonstrate quite well, I think, very well, in fact, how these regulations ultimately, as well as driving prices up, they basically eliminated competition as well. Yes, yes. And that's, of course, where big pharma gets big. It wasn't yeah. so big before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and do you really, I mean, Mary, I mean, you're, I mean, God, there's, there's very little in, in, between us in terms of age. So it's almost a borderline offensive question. But can you remember a time when there were, I mean, you already hinted at, hinted at you talked about a time when companies, when, when the generic drugs were made by lots of different companies. I mean, do you remember a time when in the United States history, maybe pre-60, you won't remember too much pre-62, but a time when drugs in general, because there were so many companies out there doing it, when drugs in general or pharmaceutical products in general were affordable. I mean, can we point yes. to a time when that was the case? Yes, in fact, uh, before the 1962 amendments, drug prices were going down every year. It was after the 62 amendments that they started going up every year. And that's because these amendments were open-ended. They've kind of metastasized throughout the system. And every year, it gets more and more expensive for drug companies to check all the regulatory boxes. So, it's about two and a half billion dollars now to get a drug to market, and it takes 12 to 14 years. So you can kind of imagine that if this number is increasing every year. Mary, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm very sorry to interrupt you. This is this is huge. This it's important that we, we, we you just repeat that. That's massive. Did you say 
is that it takes well in advance of a decade to get the drug to market. And I think you said yeah. a cost mm-hmm. of over two billion to the manufacturer. That's correct. Yes, the amendments uh, changed the time it takes from getting a drug to the lab bench to the market from four years to 14 years. And that's huge. We had, when we were working on AIDS drugs, the AIDS patients couldn't wait. They knew they'd die. So they actually hired black market chemists to make the drugs we were working on. And by the time the FDA finally gave us permission to test our drugs in people, every AIDS patient in the country who wanted them had them and was resistant. And we had to wait for new people to be diagnosed with AIDS before we could do our testing. So, yes, and and the two and a half billion dollars is going up every year. Half of that is just the cost of time, because if you if you can see that if you're taking 12 to 14 years to put a drug on the market, you either have to borrow that money or, you know, sell stock and or uh, sell bonds and pay dividends. You have to do something to get that money. And so that's another issue. And then the other issue is that only about one of every six drugs that enter clinical testing, human testing, actually make it to the market. So another big cost is the cost of all those failures. About two-thirds of the remaining cost of the drug development is is really paying for the failures. It's paying for the so, failures. I mean, I can ima- like, listening to this, I can imagine the, the, the massive corporations putting down, putting the two billion down over the 14 year period as the cost of doing business and also as the cost of getting rid of your competition because they are in a position where they can afford that. I've just got to put this to you, Mary. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going down this road now at all, but I just got to put this to you. We've, um, and by the way, um, Mary is endorsed by somebody, a lot of our listeners would have a lot of time for. Dr. Ron Paul is a big supporter of uh, Mary's work. Um, I interviewed Dr. Ron Paul a few years ago when I was uh, doing a radio show in Spain. Very nice man, very interesting man. Of course, he's a medical doctor and he endorses what Mary is saying. It's very interesting this. Mary, vaccines, and we're not going to go down this road now, but there are a lot of people concerned with vaccines and whether they're right or whether they're wrong, it doesn't take as long to get vaccines to the marketplace. I, I think I've that's been right. tweeted that, and that's dangerous, surely. Yes, and well, you know, the reason is because what was happening, the FDA was putting in so many requirements for vaccine manufacturers that they basically all quit. And so what what ended up happening is they got a law passed here in the U.S. that if there were any problems with vaccines, if they turned out not to be safe, instead of suing the drug company, the uh, people who were injured could apply to the government for reimbursement. And so now, of course, there's lots of vaccine manufacturers because that took away a lot of the liability that they have, which of course (laughs) means that the government pretty much rubber stamps vaccines and doesn't worry about it. The FDA is really not too concerned about the vaccines anymore. And that's sad because with this proliferation of vaccines, the number of vaccines that we give our children has increased so much that the current schedule calls for about 36 vaccines in the first five to six years of life. And, you know, even an adult would have trouble handling that. And so we really need to consider whether this is a good idea to give that many vaccines, especially since some of them are for diseases that really are no longer uh, very prevalent in the developed world. So we really need to rethink that. And that, that, and that doesn't even, uh, that doesn't even count problems in the vaccine itself. It's just that if you give that many vaccines or even that many drugs, and you have to realize that the child's immune system isn't well developed and it's going to create problems. It would even create problems most likely in adults. That's a really good answer, Mary. It's not because I wanted to hear that answer. I, you know, it's not an echo chamber here, but I'm glad you said that. Mary's got, a, a, I mentioned earlier on, has got degrees in biochemistry and, and physics and biophysics. It's really fair and really decent of you to say that because a lot of people are very concerned about the efficacy of vaccines. So thanks for answering that question a little bit away from what we were talking about. Folks, um, we've got Mary Ruart on the line. Mary's going to stay with us for another 10, uh, 15 minutes, enjoying this conversation. And I do recommend you check out Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health 
and how we can reclaim it. Mary's website is ruart, R-U-W-A-R-T dot com. And before she goes, she'll explain that if you do fancy purchasing a copy and checking it out, in the next um, few days or so, there are some bonuses to doing it now as opposed to later. So I'll ask Mary about that a little bit later on. Um, I can't get my head round, Mary, and, and I don't know if you remember too much. I mean, you speak to so many different people. I doubt you remember our conversation three years ago that much. But I, I just can't get my head around greed, how we could deal with greed. And, and you've done a brilliant job, and I mean that, of explaining how we've got to this situation. And I agree with you. But isn't it a case of, like, the horse is gone, don't bolt the stable door? How could we ever stop that greed now, Mary? You know, we're talking about people sure. making <laughs> billions and billions. How are they ever going to give that up? Well, when you're, if you're talking about the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. of course, the way to lower prices and everything else is to deregulate so we'll have more competition. Competition really keeps pricing in check. And, you know, we talked a little bit earlier on the show about how when generics had um, a lot of generic companies had gone out of business and there was a monopoly for particular drugs, it, it basically gives the manufacturer carte blanche to charge what they want. So what we need to do is make sure there's competition. And the way you do that, of course, is making sure that the barrier to entry is not very high. We talked about how much it really costs to put a drug on the market, two and a half billion dollars. So what happens today, at least in the U.S., is small companies, small startup companies figure out what might be a good drug and then they have to go to big pharma and license it to them so big pharma can develop it. Occasionally, occasionally one of these small companies tries it on their own and a few do make it, but some go bankrupt. And that's really sad because the the drugs that are really new and important are the ones that are the most difficult to develop because you don't know how much drug to give. You don't know how often you have to give it. You don't know how many people you need in your studies to get the statistical significance that the FDA has. And this is the kind of problem I actually had when I was in the industry. The FDA actually called me up and said, Dr. Ruart, we really want to help you get prostaglandins for liver disease on the market. We know you just filed a patent for that and we're very, very excited. But even with the FDA rooting for us, we could not get through the process because it was so difficult because it was a new compound. If we guessed wrong on any of these parameters and we did these studies that took years and didn't have the statistical significance we needed, we'd have to start over and the drug would be generic the first day it was on the market and we'd never recover our costs. Now I sympathize, so, I sympathize with that, but imagine there's a, you know full well, Mary, there is a listener somewhere listening going, well, that might have saved lives, Mary. Oh, it might have. Yes. And, and we wanted to develop it. The problem is if we develop things that we can't recover our costs for, we go out of business yeah. and then there's no more new drugs. But but you see, because the regulations are getting tougher every year and they cost more money and they take more time, more and more drugs that are innovative are being kept on the laboratory shelf instead of getting to market for just the reasons we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Now, if these regulations made drugs safer or more effective, there might be a reason to have them. But in fact, as I show in Death by Regulation, drugs are no more safe or no more effective than they were before the amendments. And the reason for that is that most drugs that get on the market that are unsafe are, are drugs that have faults that we can't see when we do our original testing. It's only when large numbers of people take them that we find these subpopulations of people who are very sensitive to them. And so that's usually the problem. Now with Vioxx, it was a different story. There was actually some indication that the drug was a bad drug. But when one of the FDA examiners, David Graham, brought this to the attention of his supervisors, his supervisors said, Oh, well, you know, the drug company is our client, not the wow, American public, wow, not Congress, yeah. <laughs> and they yeah. put it on the market anyway. That was really stupid. <laughs> and this is a brilliant point you're making, because you were saying that competition destroyed by regulation, if it hadn't been, maybe companies wouldn't behave like that. Maybe they wouldn't knowingly put a bad drug on the market because they would know or they would believe that the, the wider public at large would say, well, we're not going to use that company again. Exactly. But, 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 but they can't happens. do that, right? Because right. these are the only companies that exist, 
Right. Well, and yeah. that's what happened before the amendments. You know, reputation was incredibly important. Doctors wouldn't prescribe your medication if you had a couple bad drugs on the market. But after the 1962 amendments, the FDA approval became the gold standard. And that was a problem because now, now doctors didn't look at who put the, which company put out the drug. They looked at, does it have FDA approval or not? Right. Mary, this is, this is, um, it's terrific that you've given me a lot of, I mean, spend a bit of time over the weekend um, flicking through uh, the book and, and it is really, really well written and really interesting and it's given me a couple of moments of pause, you know, and like it, more than a couple of moments of pause, because as I said, I, I'd have grown up, you know, I, these days, of course, I've got a huge problem with governments because of the things governments are doing, you know, bombing uh, third world countries overseas, funding, yes. arming <laughs> rebels and you know all about this and all these terrible things. They're horrible um, entities, governments, as we understand them to be today. But but I always had this thing, thing about massive corporations and shackles being taken off them. And and I, I'll be honest, I didn't consider for a long time that you know that that these organisations like the FDA and its uh, counter organisations in Europe have actually worked to do all the things that it was supposed not to do, or the things it was supposed to prevent. And um, you're, you're demonstrating that. I've got to ask you, by the way, it's uh, Dr. Mary Ruart, folks, and uh, you go, go to ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T. Mary, if I'm mispronouncing the surname, feel free to give me a smack and tell me how to say it properly. Um, death by regulation, how we were robbed of a golden age of health and how we can reclaim it is the book. It is, it's Dr. Mary Ruart, right? Or you, yeah, I am saying it right. Yes, yeah. you've got it right. Ruart, soft W. Uh-huh. Soft W. <laughs> Thanks very much. Now, um, obviously you're on a, a, an independent and a kind of an alternative news program. So our listeners are very interested in this and they're very interested in how we're watching in, especially here, the European, the UK, of course, has chosen to leave the European Union, thank God. Whether it ever, whether, whether it ever will or not is another thing. It might not. Powerful entities are working to prevent that happening. But what, what we've seen, Mary, in recent years were harmless, certainly harmless, homeopathic remedies, medicines from the Far East, herbal treatments that people have used for generations they are being effectively banned and outlawed and taken off the market. And our listeners want me to ask you, the the more natural or the, naturopath, the naturopathic remedies, are they suffering as a result of exactly what you've been describing to us today? Yes, yes. The 1962 amendments have been used to really destroy uh, the prevention industry in the U.S. I mean, we, we've, I, I shouldn't say destroy totally, but it's really set it back. There were a lot of prosecutions of people who s- sold nutrients because the FDA claims that if you try to make a health claim for a nutrient, it becomes a drug and needs to go through this 12 to 14 years of testing before you can say anything about it. Yeah. So, for example, when we discovered in the early 1980s that folic acid, a B vitamin, could prevent birth defects, the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers that if they even talked about the scientific publications that showed this, that they would shut them down. And even when the Center for Disease Control, another government agency, started recommending that young women take folic acid supplements because they need them in the first month or two or of pregnancy to be effective, then the, uh, the FDA told folic acid manufacturers they would shut them down. So there was about a 12-year period where young American women didn't know they should be taking folic acid to prevent these birth defects. And about 10 to 15,000 American babies were needlessly born with them. And many more were aborted because you can test for this when the child's in the mother. So this was very sad. And this is the type of thing that these amendments really created a problem with. And actually, I think Europe is experiencing this to some extent too, because what happens in the U.S. tends to ripple out, and there's an effort to harmonize all of the regulatory agencies and make them all do the same thing. And, and their basis is basically what's happening with the FDA in the U.S. My understanding, for example, is that in Germany, they've already made vitamin C over 100 milligrams, a prescription item. <laughs> and, wow. You know, in the U.S., we take, you know, we take lots of vitamins, but uh, it's amazing. getting harder to get good information because the FDA 
basically puts a muzzle on supplement manufacturers if they make any health claims. In fact, cherries and walnut growers have gotten threatening letters from the FDA simply because they point to scientific publications that show that components of walnuts and cherries are beneficial to your health. Wow, Mary. Do you know, thinking of you coming on today and thinking about speaking with you and, you know, my understanding of the world being, in the past, being much different than, than yours. And I was wondering about, have we, I mean, I think it's deliberate. I think it's been manufactured. We, we, we're all jumping into, we're boxing ourselves into pigeonholes these days. Identity politics rules. I'm a socialist. I'm a liberal or I'm a conservative or I'm whatever. And we're more and more and more reluctant to engage with somebody who's saying something that is new to us or is strange to us. And it's, 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 to me, it's the death of reason, the death of education when you don't speak to, more importantly, when you don't listen to somebody who's got something a bit different to say. How do you deal with this paradigm, Mary? I mean, look, there, there are many like you, of course, um, many, many, many men and women like you who, um, who, who, um, research the information you're researching but there are others who it's not even that they just don't agree with it they're just not prepared to listen how do you deal with that well you know we're all after the same thing we all want a safe prosperous world we want a peaceful world we just differ in how we think we can get there so it makes perfect sense for us to have these kinds of discussions that we're having right now you know and richie you're really very open-minded and everything and looking at these things and and i try to be too because if somebody can show me that what i'm talking about uh, doesn't create a more peaceful and prosperous world where everyone, you know, can enjoy harmony and abundance, then we're obviously not going in the right direction. So I think, first of all, it's necessary to recognize that even if we put a different label on, pretty much all of us want the same thing. So instead of getting upset with labels or upset with someone's suggestions, it's good to enter into discussion and find out what really works. And that's, as you know, when we talked three years ago, I was I was talking a lot about my book, Healing Our World, yes. which you know, has over a thousand references of how liberty works in the real world. Because if it's not practical, <laughs> if it doesn't work in the real world, why bother? Yeah, and you have an academic approach. I mean, I, I trust you know, people, I, I don't know you personally, but from reading you and listening to you doing other interviews, I trust that in, if information came across your desk that in any way contradicted or disproved something you had previously believed, I like to believe that you would take it on board and you would factor it into your research. I don't doubt that. Death by Regulation is Mary's brand new book, Ruart, R-U-W-A-R-T dot com, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It. Got about 90 seconds left, Mary. There are bonuses and there are add-ons for people who do take up the option of uh, getting the book now. Do you want to talk about those? Yes, yes. If you go to Amazon.com and order your book, Send me your receipt through my website, ruart.com, and I will link you up to the bonus pages. There's about $60 of bonuses right now, and the bonuses are actually going to shift this week. So if you want to take advantage of both sets of bonuses, you can order a book now today, and then you can order another book in a couple days for a friend. And uh, certainly, like I said, go to ruart.com, just forward me your receipt, and I will forward you links to the bonuses. Really enjoyed speaking with you again, Mary. I certainly won't be leaving it as long before getting in, in touch with you. Folks, Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It by uh, Mary Ruart, PhD. Check it out, Amazon.com. Uh, Go to Mary's website, Ruart, or U-W-A-R-T dot com. Mary, thanks so much. I really enjoyed that. Thanks for coming on. Well, you're welcome, and your European guests can go to their Amazon site. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be U.S. It can be, you know, at Amazon or wherever you are. Yeah, that's the <laughs> one, yeah, yeah. Or Amazon.fr. Mary, thanks so much. Look after yourself. Bye for now. Bye-bye, Richie. Bye, that was great. Dr. Mary Ruart, live on the line there from Texas. Check out the book, Death by Regulation, How We Were Robbed of a Golden Age of Health and How We Can Reclaim It. Fascinating read. It is. Mary sent it to me 
late last week and have been reading it and flicking through it. And a lot of thought-provoking things in there. For somebody who would have previously, as I said before, you know, when I've had people like Jeff Berwick on and others, libertarians. I mean, Jeff would describe himself, I suppose, as, a, uh, as an anarchist of uh, sorts. Uh, Mary's certainly not an anarchist or anything like it. Libertarian is completely different. But... Um, it certainly opened my mind and has had me asking questions about some of these issues. Really interesting stuff. Check out ruart, R-U-W-A-R-T dot com. 